Good evening, everyone. I'm Beth Jones Sanborn, moderator for Meet the Candidates for State Representative. I would like to welcome the public and the viewers to this event and thank you for your interest. On November 6th, you will have the opportunity to vote for your state representative. And in the municipal chamber tonight, we have our candidates for District 27, Representative Andrew McLean and his challenger, Roger Densmore. Welcome, candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as is sometimes the case, uh, our representative for District 26, Maureen Terry, is running uncontested, and she is in the room this evening and would like to address the public and offer some comments to her constituents before we begin the forum this evening. So, Maureen. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Georgia, and go, Kat for letting the candidates present themselves tonight. We really appreciate you keeping our town informed of everything. Uh, my name is Maureen Terry, and I live right here in Gorham Village. I'm married to Parnell, who works for the school department, and I have three children, all daughters, uh, one in college, one in high school, who's a senior, and one is a sophomore in high school. Um, I operate a false, small food production business out of my own certified home kitchen, and I sell my product, granola, all over, all over the area. Um, I also am a chef, and I keep my skills honed by cooking at a local market, Carter's Market, which is one of our new businesses here in town. Uh, with my background, I assumed that I would be on the education committee uh, when I was elected, or if I was lucky enough to be elected, which I was, so thank you. Um, I was on the board of my kids' preschool. I uh, successfully, I think, <laughs> navigated uh, at least one child from the K through 12 process um, and am working on the other two. Uh, I was part of the Gorham Educational Foundation, so it made sense to me that I would be put on the education committee, and of course I was put on the taxation committee. Uh, I was very surprised um, and asked what on earth someone was thinking putting me on the taxation committee, and it came down to my business. Apparently my business is uh, uh, like about 95 other businesses in the state of Maine, small, one employee or less, based out of your home. Um, it's been a true privilege getting to know some of the other folks that are in the same position that I'm in and talking to them and sharing their stories and their struggles and their strengths in Augusta. Um, I understand what it's like to be in their position and I'm ready to work with whomever it takes to get businesses to run smoothly. Um, I'm extremely grateful for the position I found myself in, and I'm honored that my neighbors in District 26 have chosen me to represent them. I'm ready to keep up the good work and bring our challenges and our solutions to Augusta in the next two years. Thank you. And thank you again, Maureen. So moving back to District 26, the candidates have been provided with questions prior to this broadcast, as we've done in other events. The questions will be rotated through the evening, and the candidates will have up to two minutes to answer any question. Any questions, gentlemen, please keep in mind the World Series starts tonight, so if you can keep on time, that would be much appreciated. Uh, we will start with opening comments, and prior to the show, we literally flipped a coin, so Roger will be leading off with his opening comments. Roger, the Great. floor is Thank yours. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you for those in attendance today and those at home watching. My name is Roger Densmore. I've been a resident in Gorham for almost three years now with my girlfriend, Carla. We have two four-legged rescue fur baby dogs. Uh, Gillette and to echo Beth Fenway, go Sox, uh, both under two years old. I currently am working at Camp Sunshine in Casco. Uh, Camp Sunshine is a retreat for children with terminally illness. Um, it's a retreat for their families and the children. It's the only one like it um, in the world. We've represented all 50 states and over 24 uh, different countries. It's all fully funded. Uh, free of charge to the families. Uh, for almost the last eight years, my girlfriend and I had owned and operated a small business that we purchased in Portland. And due to rising costs and taxes, we uh, moved the business to South Portland. And this past uh, July, we sold that. Prior to working at Camp Sunshine, I was a golf professional for the last 20 years, of which almost 16 years were spent here in the state of Maine. Um, in Scarborough, 
in South Portland, in Casco, and up in Booth Bay. So I have uh, extensive business background as that of a small business owner, as well as uh, dealing with managing businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And Andrew, your opening comments. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for being here tonight, and thank you for those who are listening in tonight or watching. My name is Andrew McLean, and I have had the immense privilege and honor to serve three terms in the Maine House of Representatives, representing part of Gorham and part of Scarborough. It's one of the most humbling uh, tasks that I have ever uh, had in my life. And during my time uh, campaigning, uh, as well as serving in legislature, I've knocked on thousands of doors in Gorham and Scarborough, had thousands of conversations with people about their hopes, about their dreams, and about their frustrations. And I have taken all of these to heart and taken all of them with me to Augusta. While we may not have agreed on everything, I have always taken both compliments and criticism to heart in an effort to better serve our community. I've worked very hard every day because I believe that this job is one of the most important that one can hold. I've worked across the aisle to form successful and lasting relationships with Republicans and Democrats to ensure that the work we do doesn't get tangled up in politics, but instead is focused on what is right for our communities. During my time over my six years in the legislature, we have staved off massive property tax increases, made substantial increases to education funding, invested in our infrastructure, and even passed legislation to begin the process of local concern and of local importance uh, in constructing the Gorham Connector to reduce traffic congestion in Gorham. We have a lot of work ahead of us uh, in the next few years laying out a blueprint for our future, and I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll get going right away with, with the questions for this evening. Starting off uh, on the topic of clean elections, the Maine Clean Election Act established a voluntary program of full public financing of political campaigns for candidates running for governor, state senator, and state rep. What do you think about the program, and have you, in fact, used it? And Andrew, we'll start with you. Great, thank you. Um, I, uh, I support the Maine Clean Elections Act, and I support the Maine uh, Clean Elections Program. I personally have not used it, but I do believe that it serves a worthwhile purses, uh, purpose. Excuse me. The reality is we have too much money in politics, and it is grossly distorting uh, the way that politicians operate in Augusta and, frankly, at the federal level as well. The program in Maine, however, is designed to make sure that ordinary people can run for office, people who don't have extraordinary means, who don't have the ability to fundraise thousands of dollars. Uh, we need to make sure that those people have a voice and an ability to run for office, and that's what the Clean Elections Act does. Several years ago, I voted to strengthen that program to increase the amount of funding that candidates are able to receive, uh, and I believe that that was a worthwhile effort. For me, I have elected not to use the program because I, I like uh, soliciting small-dollar contributions from friends and neighbors in Gorham. Um, either way is a perfectly acceptable way to run for office. But the reality is that the Maine Clean Elections uh, program is there to serve a purpose, and it should remain and it should be fully funded by the legislature. Thank you. And Roger, your response to the Clean Election Act. I have not used the program. Uh, I am traditionally funding my campaign. Uh, for me, it's, it's a personal issue that uh, I don't feel taxpayers' money um, should be used to fund political campaigns. I think that should be up to the candidate. Uh, I myself have uh, decided to run a very lean campaign. I have put some of my own personal money in there and have solicited uh, a small donation from friends and constituents. So, because I, I agree, I believe there is an astronomical amount of money spent um, and frankly, I think wasted uh, on political campaigns that could be put to better use in local communities. However, with that being said, the people of Maine have voted to adopt this form of campaign finance and in the past have reaffirmed their support of it. So obviously that the people have spoken, so um, you know, I would go forward with, with the program. Uh, I do have concerns with the level of funding, however, um, and I'm, I kind of question that maybe if the gubernatorial candidates uh, should be allowed to uh, use their funds as it seems their um, campaigns uh, require a lot more money. Okay, thank you, Roger. 
Uh, moving on to the subject of um, taxes and revenue sharing, as you know, revenue sharing was established in 1972 as a way for the state to help local uh, localities pay the costs of mandatory services like school roads, fire and police. And since the state law prohibits municipalities from levying a local sales tax, so the state is supposed to provide 5% of sales income and corporate taxes to municipalities, but lawmakers haven't hit that level in more than a decade. As part of the current two-year budget, lawmakers reduced revenue sharing to 2% in order to send an additional $90 million into the state's general fund. Now, this action uh, seems to have an adverse effect on property taxes. So what is your position on revenue sharing? And Roger, you can take the lead on this one. Uh, I believe revenue sharing is a uh, extremely important part of the budgetary process for municipalities, and I would support it. I would actually support increasing uh, that rather than the money sitting in a fund and taxing. Uh, taxpayers uh, at a higher level where that money could be better served at the um, for the families you know whether it be an extra tank of gas and a couple extra refills of oil during the winter uh, but I would I would like to just have in-depth conversations with local officials uh, to find out how we can better help them uh, as well as reduce the tax burden on uh, individuals here in Gorham thank you Roger Andrew thank you Many times uh, in our legislative work in Augusta, uh, we aim to do good things, uh, but oftentimes it is about stopping bad things from happening as well. And that's what we had to do six years ago. Six years ago, we were the legislature was given a budget by Governor LePage that completely eliminated revenue sharing. It would have been devastating for Gorham. It would have been devastating for municipalities across the state. What we were able to do was restore part of that revenue sharing. We weren't able to restore all of it, but we were able to restore some of it, which staved off massive property tax increases uh, for residents of Gorham and Scarborough and folks across the state. So I support uh, fully funding revenue sharing. We have obviously been in a very uh, tough predicament over the last several years because we keep receiving budgets that want to, uh, that aim to eliminate or reduce revenue sharing. And we can't afford to do that. So uh, those who understand the importance of revenue sharing to our local communities have tried to restore as much as we can of that revenue sharing uh, to, uh, to the state budget so that cities and towns uh, are not forced to raise, uh, raise property taxes. Um, I'm a property taxpayer myself, and I understand uh, the implications of not funding revenue sharing. That means uh, those who are low and middle income uh, are forced to make a decision, sometimes between eating or their medicine and paying their property taxes, and that's unacceptable. So I look forward in the next legislature to working with a new governor to fully fund revenue sharing and make sure that uh, and make sure that uh, property taxes do not keep going up because uh, of, the, of uh, uh, a, a failed budget uh, proposal. Thank you. Moving on to the subject of Medicaid expansion, certainly a subject that's been on the minds of Mainers. Uh, both houses of the Maine legislature voted to approve funding to extend, extend Medicaid to an estimated 70,000 Maine residents. Maine voters approved expanding Medicaid by a margin of 59% to 41%. So first off, is adequate health care a right for every citizen? Why or why not? And did you or would you have voted for the expansion? Andrew, we'll start with you this time. Great. I do believe that health care is a fundamental right. It is a human right. No person should go uh, without the ability to see a doctor uh, just because they cannot afford uh, that care. So with that being said, I supported Medicaid expansion because I believe that the 70,000 people who would have benefited from the expansion of Medicaid uh, will eventually save the state money and will also help those people access uh, care and treatment that they need. Um, Mainers, uh, first of all, the legislature voted on this uh, five or six times uh, over the last uh, four or five years. I voted to expand Medicaid every single time, uh, and Maine voters voted last year overwhelmingly to support Medicaid expansion, and we owe it not just to the state, but, but specifically the 70,000 people who would benefit from the expansion of that program. Now, the federal government is gonna fund part of that expansion, 
and the state is going to have to um, pick up a small portion of that. The reality is that over the long term, this is going to save our state money because people are going to have better access to better care. They're not going to have to take a job just because they need health insurance. They're going to be able to do what they want. Uh, and we are going to see better outcomes over the long term. So not only do I believe that this is the morally right thing to do, I believe it is the fiscally responsible thing to do to expand Medicaid. Uh, and I look forward to working in January uh, with a new legislature and a new governor that will uh, implement Medicaid expansion in an expeditious and efficient manner. Thank you, Andrew. Roger, your thoughts on the Medicaid expansion? Um, I do believe that everyone should have the right to access affordable health care. Um, I did not vote for the Medicare expansion, uh, strictly for the reason the uh, there was not a sensible or withstanding funding mechanism in place. Usually when legislation is made in Augusta, that is taken into consideration. Um, unfortunately, the ballot initiative that those um, concerns aren't addressed. Um, but yet again, the main uh, voters have spoken. They uh, have passed the expansion, and so the legislature needs to figure out a way to make sure that we can sensibly uh, fund this going forward without raising taxes on uh, Mainers. Uh, we're already taxed high enough as it is. Um, and you know we need to look at other ways to reduce costs. Um, alternative preventive medicine, um, going to get checkups regularly rather than waiting until something catastrophic happens. Um, and I can speak from experience. I was one of those individuals that only goes to a doctor when they don't feel well or they, don't, or they have broken something. And I came down with uh, symptoms that I didn't realize were a heart attack. And for two and a half days, I didn't go to the, uh, the doctors because I figured it was going to pass. Uh, where that it was something that if I had gone to the doctors prior to, um, something that could have been staved off and um, you know saved saved money and the healthcare uh, side of things, rather than having to go through what I went through. Thank you. Staying on the same subject for uh, one more question, and but this response. Uh, keep to one minute. Um, do you have any ideas, proposals, ways to improve or modify the Medicaid, ex Medicaid expansion or to make it more efficient? And Roger, we'll start with you this time. Um, again, I think uh, pretty much my, I, I don't have uh, a hard idea on, on that. Um, like I said, I didn't look into it as much. I was more concerned of the funding of the bill. And so I think that is something that needs to be addressed uh, at the legislature level. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah, I think that there are several, several things that we can do. The reality is, is this would have been cheaper to implement two years ago when we had more federal funding uh, available to us. At this point, because we have delayed uh, implementing Medicaid expansion, it's going to cost a little bit more, unfortunately. Um, but there certainly are ways to reduce costs. Uh, it, simply implementing Medicaid expansion is going to reduce costs for Mainers over the long term because people are going to have access to health care. Uh, when, when someone goes to the emergency room who doesn't have health care, the hospitals are mandated to uh, treat that person. And so who picks up the tab? It's the person who does have health insurance, like me and many, many other Mainers. Uh, so we need to ensure those people uh, that way that the hospitals are getting paid, the hospitals are getting reimbursed, so that the costs don't get borne by those who already have insurance. And so simply implementing Medicaid expansion is going to lower costs over the long term. Um, and then there are a, a, num a number of other measures that we can take uh, as we begin to reform the system uh, and see how it works in the state. Thank you. Uh, switching to a different topic now, <clears throat> it's certainly no secret that the opioid crisis is a is a national emergency and that Maine has been one of the hardest hit states uh, throughout uh, the evolution of that crisis. Now, uh, we know that addiction is a complex uh, mental and physical disorder, so what programs need to be prioritized and supported or, or perhaps uh, created uh, to help start effectively addressing the situation for Mainers? Andrew, we'll start with you. Great. 
The opioid crisis is, is truly a crisis. Uh, it has devastated families, it has devastated communities, uh, it has devastated relationships, and we need to take a comprehensive approach to this particular issue. And we have begun that. We haven't done enough, frankly, in the legislature. We haven't done enough as a country to address this particular issue. Uh, but we have begun to address it. In the last uh, budget cycle, we uh, funded, uh, I think, about 12 new law enforcement positions to deal specifically with the opioid crisis. We, uh, we funded several new uh, treatment facilities to, uh, to deal with the opioid crisis, people who are suffering from addiction. And so those are two of the measures that we took last year uh, to try and deal with this. On a human level, we also need to deal with this issue as well, because one of the greatest challenges to the opioid crisis is the stigma that is attached to it. People shouldn't feel ashamed about having an addiction. It is a disease, and we need to treat it like a disease. And this particular disease cuts across social and economic barriers. It doesn't matter if you're, you're poor or rich, or you live in Gorham, or you live in Fort Kent. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a fisherman or you're a lawyer. Uh, people who uh, are in all areas of our state and all sectors of our economy are dealing with this crisis, and we owe it to them uh, to find uh, a comprehensive solution. I also want to say that expanding Medicaid is also part of the solution. There are 70,000 people who have not been able to access, 70,000 low-income people who have not been able to access health insurance uh, for many, many years. By providing access to health insurance, people are going to have access uh, to a therapist and a treatment facility so they can get the care that they need. And so there are many, many ways to address this issue. Those are just a few of the, uh, of the measures that we have taken over the last uh, couple of years to try to address this issue. Thank you, Andrew. Roger, your thoughts on addressing the opioid crisis as it affects Maine? I agree. Uh, it's not only a crisis, it seems to be an epidemic not only for Maine, but across the country. Um, and this isn't a partisan issue, and it's not even based on economic status. Uh, there needs to be a comprehensive approach. Uh, we need to continue to educate the dangers of drug use at all ages, uh, provide therapies for addiction, um, and properly prosecute dealers who bring this stuff into state or those who um, have prescriptions that aren't using them that are selling them. Um, and I agree, we need to step up law enforcement to keep this stuff from coming out of the state, prosecute uh, the dealers heavily, um, and then also look at uh, how the, you know, how individuals are getting these drugs that aren't prescribed to them. Um, we should look at alternative treatments for those who are injured and in pain and not go to opioids as the uh, first line of pain relief. Thank you. Moving to another uh, global issue with ramifications right here in Maine, uh, talking about climate change. Our fishing industry has been significantly impacted. There have been shoreline effects, flooding issues, and invasive pests and plants, just to name a few of the manifestations of climate change here in Maine. What are we doing to address this issue at the state level? Is it enough? And in fact, could there be economic opportunities that arise by seeking to deal with climate change here in Maine? And Roger, we'll start with you. Um, climate change is not really a um, issue that I've done a whole lot of research in. I know there are many conflicting opinions out there uh, that I haven't really decided one way or the other that where I've come down on. Um, obviously, we're experiencing um, record number of storms as well as the strength of these storms. Um, I would look at supporting alternative forms of energy, but I wouldn't want to uh, necessarily do that um, with subsidizing them where the costs are being passed down to those who can't afford them uh, regarding clean energy of either solar or wind. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you. First, let me say that I believe climate change is real. Uh, I believe science. I believe the science that the scientists are telling us that our oceans are warming, that our climate is warming in parts of, uh, parts of the world, and we're going to see uh, more significant effects of climate change in the coming decades. Um, the science, frankly, is overwhelming, and we must address this challenge, and there is no community, no state that is too small to address this issue. 
we need to think about climate change on a local, uh, a state, and a federal level. Um, and so there's a lot that Maine can do. And frankly, there's a lot that Maine can benefit from if we address climate change. Most importantly are some of the opportunities in the clean and renewable energy sector. Whether that's tidal or solar uh, or wind energy, uh, we have tremendous opportunity in our state. We are a very large state. We're generally a very sunny state. We have a lot of coastline. We have quite a few uh, areas that we could benefit from tidal power. Uh, in many parts of our state, it's very windy. And so we need to, to look into those uh, types of renewable energy and invest in those sorts of uh, projects that for too long we have neglected. We, we could have a very significant clean energy um, uh, sector in our state, but for the ideology that has really hindered uh, the development of those projects over the last six or eight years. So I look forward in the next legislature to really working on some comprehensive, sustainable projects that still uh, recognize that we need to use gas and natural gas and oil, but we need to incentivize the development of these renewable uh, energy programs. Our universities are working on them. We have uh, the private sector that are working on them. So we have a lot of opportunities, not only to address climate change, but also take advantage of some of the new sectors uh, that, that could uh, come about in our economy. Thank you. Shifting to another uh, national issue, gun safety and gun legislation. Maine is considered one of the safest states in the country. Uh, looking at some data made available through USA Today, Maine's violent crime rate is 123.8 uh, violent crimes per 100,000 people. And that is one of the lowest, if not the lowest rates in the country. In regard to firearm deaths, Maine is also towards the lower end with 8.2 firearm deaths per 100,000 people. Now, that being said, do you still approve of constitutional carry? And we'll start with a one-minute response from Andrew. Uh, two or three years ago, the legislature voted to repeal the requirement that, uh, that those who have a concealed weapon on them uh, have to get a permit. So folks no longer have to get a permit in order to uh, carry a concealed weapon. I did not support that measure. I believe that someone who is carrying a concealed weapon should have to get a permit from a law enforcement agency. I still believe that. Uh, it is not the law anymore. So uh, people are able to, to do that without a permit. Um, I do not support uh, constitutional carry. Uh, but of course, it is not, that is not the law anymore. Thank you. And Roger, just your thoughts on constitutional carry as legislation. Uh, yes, I do uh, approve of constitutional carry. I don't think limiting uh, the rights of law-abiding citizens um, is something that, that we need to do, and I'm glad that it was passed. As you have stated, Maine um, is one of the lowest um, in the country regarding gun laws. Um, we have plenty of hunters and plenty of individuals uh, that use guns on a regular basis. So. Mm -hmm. Staying on the subject for, for one more question, a two-minute response on this. So, as you know, the predominant weapon used in game hunting is a rifle or a long gun, although you can hunt with a handgun. It's typically not how it's done. Uh, by far, though, the greatest number of violent crimes are committed with handguns. Is it a valid point that perhaps we should be looking at handgun laws differently um, than perhaps other types of weaponry? Uh, Roger, we'll start with you. Um, I don't believe so. I don't think the Second Amendment, uh, the right to bear arms, makes a distinction between handguns and rifles. And I don't believe that adding more uh, gun laws is going to necessarily make uh, the public safer. If someone's going to commit a crime, um, the law is not going to prevent them to do that. If something that they have made their minds up they're going to do, um, as we know, uh, they don't follow the laws. So, no. Okay, thank you. Andrew, your thoughts on that? Gun, the issue of gun violence is a, a scourge on, on our nation. There are too many young people, there are too many middle-aged people, and there are too many older people who are getting killed uh, at the hands of guns. I support the Second Amendment. I believe that people have a constitutional right to carry a weapon, to have a weapon, or have as many weapons as they want. But I do believe that there are reasonable limitations that we can place 
on the ownership of a weapon, that there are reasonable solutions that both Democrats and Republicans can come together to try and reduce the number of gun deaths in our country. We're never going to eliminate the number of, we're never going to completely eliminate gun deaths in our country. But the idea that we should tolerate 33,000 people dying every year because they got shot is simply unacceptable to me. There are solutions that, that we can come up with. Uh, there are solutions that we have come up with in the legislature. For example, uh, one of the bills that we worked on last year was an attempt to try and get those who shouldn't have guns, like domestic uh, abusers, folks who have committed domestic violence, uh, to have their guns taken away for a on a short-term basis uh, if uh, their spouse comes in uh, to court uh, and, uh, uh, and identifies them as having been uh, an abuser. Uh, those folks should, should not have guns. We should make sure that those who are fearful that someone is going to use a gun on them are not able to do that. So there are small things that we can do, uh, and there are large efforts that we can undertake at the federal level to try and reduce the issue of gun violence. But it is a significant issue, not just in our state, but across the country, and we have to find a solution because it is just unacceptable that we continue uh, to see school shooting after school shooting and community shooting after community shooting. Uh, I support the Second Amendment, uh, but I do believe that there are ways that we can address this issue without impinging on the right of uh, those who own a gun. Thank you. Moving back to questions of, of the economy, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust states that middle, uh, middle income ranges from 45000 to $130,000. Do you think it's sound judgment to develop social and financial policies for citizens when some of the benchmarks show that kind of, that kind of variance in terms of the drastic spread of wealth um, amongst people with different needs? A couple of examples being LIHEAP, fuel, for the, fuel help for the poor, and uh, help with the cost of child care. So Andrew, we'll start with you on this. Right. Well, I, I'm not an economist, so I'm not in the business of determining uh, who and, and what uh, is a, is a middle-class uh, person. Uh, I'll leave it to the economists and the individuals to make that determination for themselves. Uh, but I also believe that income very much depends on where we live. There are, there are uh, locations in our state uh, where uh, $50,000 income means more than, than other places. And so it's very location dependent. Um, but generally speaking, during my time in the legislature, I have supported measures to reduce taxes on low and middle income people. I don't support lowering taxes on high income earners at the expense of low and middle income people. Uh, I have worked across the aisle to increase uh, the property tax fairness credit, which allows a credit uh, for property taxpayers at the end of the year uh, to get money back because of the high cost of property taxes. We've east, uh, increased education funding uh, in the state. Uh, all in an effort to, sure, to ensure that local taxpayers and middle income earners don't continue to get pinched. Uh, those who are working low and min middle income earners uh, deserve to have their, their taxes lowered. Um, and I have worked in the legislature to ensure that we are not making it more difficult for working families uh, to make a living here in Maine. Thank you. Roger. Thank you. Um, I believe we, we need to ensure that those that are most vulnerable, are most needy, um, and those on a low income are a high priority in our state. Um, as a state, we need to do a better job of this, um, protecting the segment and funding our wait lists, something that has been, hasn't been completely addressed uh, at the state legislature, I feel. Um, for the higher tier income, uh, I think we need to ensure that we don't promote a policy that will drive them away. Uh, you know, Maine is already the third highest tax state uh, in the country, and I, I don't think that uh, being number one is something that we want to strive for. Thank you, Roger. On a somewhat related uh, note, uh, we'll be looking for your thoughts, agreement, disagreement on ballot question one, and just to reflect, uh, refresh, excuse me, 
uh, the memories of our audience here this evening, uh, ballot question one is an act to establish universal home care for seniors and persons with disability. And the verbiage on that question is as follows. Do you want to create the universal home care program to provide home-based assistance to people with disabilities and senior citizens, regardless of income, funded by a 3.8% tax on individuals and families with main wages and adjusted gross income above the amount subject to Social Security taxes, which is $128,400 in 2018? Uh, gentlemen, your thoughts on ballot question one, agreement, disagreement. Uh, Roger, we'll start with you. Um, I would say I'm not opposed to home-based assistance, um, but this I don't feel is the way to go. Um, something like this, I believe, should have come forth with a proposal from the legislature so all sides could be heard and all ideas could be brought to the table. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't feel taxing um, main individuals, regardless of income, to uh, pay for uh, this uh, program is the way to go. Um, we definitely should have had an open discussion on how to properly fund this um, in an ongoing manner through equitable means. Thank you, Roger. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, I do not support question one. I plan to vote no on question one, and I'd like to explain why. I think the home care initiative is an admirable one, and we certainly should be addressing these issues in the legislature. But the citizens' initiative process, in my view, is an appropriate venue for, uh, for voting on relatively simple questions. Do you support an increase in the minimum wage? Do you support ranked choice voting? Do you support marriage equality for gay and lesbian couples? The more complex matters that we have to ad address in, uh, through policy making, like tax policy, deserve a public hearing. They deserve to have issues bounce back and forth. Uh, different sides. Uh, we deserve to hear from the public on these complex matters. And so with respect to this particular issue, because it involves uh, a significant uh, increase in taxes, it involves some complex tax policy, it deserves more attention. Uh, and it deserves a process in the legislature where both sides can be heard uh, and we can come out with a better proposal. I have always believed that the best proposals that we come out with in the legislature, the best work that we do is the work that's done together. And so the work uh, of the tax committee, the work uh, of the appropriations committee uh, would, would likely yield a better uh, legislative result uh, should we take this up in January. Thank you. Uh, moving on to a different topic, uh, civility in government. Um, be interested to hear each of you assess the functionality of our state government as we make way for a new governor. And then could that new governor be a constructive reset? And what role are you going to take in making sure that happens? So Andrew, we'll start with you. Great. I have served in the legislature for six years and it has been, it has been a difficult six years. Um, we have had a lot of, uh, we've had many good proposals that have uh, been stymied by ideology, by, uh, by, um, uh, by politics, frankly. And we owe it to the people of Maine to put our politics, to put our political hats aside when we get to the legislature. There's a time to campaign, there's a time to govern. And when we get to the legislature, we need to take off our R&D and I hats, and we need to learn to work together. That is what I have tried to do over the last six years. When I was elected in 2012, I made a commitment to work with both Republicans and Democrats and independents to try and figure out the best proposals uh, for moving our economy and our state forward. When I was appointed to serve on the Transportation Committee, I made sure to set up individual meetings with all members of my committee, Republicans and Democrats, to get their ideas, figure out what makes them tick, and find out ways to move forward on specific issues, specifically related to transportation. When I became chair of the committee two years later after I was appointed by the Speaker of the House, I sat down again with the new committee members and wanted to find out more about them. What made them tick? What, why did they want to be on that committee? What, what work was important to them? And those relationships that you build yield success later on when you are dealing with significant and sometimes uh, controversial legislation. And those relationships have 
uh, have become very valuable over, over the years. Specifically, I want to point to one example. The GORM connector, uh, we passed legislation uh, two years ago to begin the process of constructing the GORM connector, which is a very, very big issue in GORM. Uh, it will reduce traffic, it'll create a more livable community. Well, our committee dealt with that particular issue. We had a unanimous report that came out of committee. Every single member voted for it. Uh, it went through the legislature, the governor vetoed it, and we were able to override the governor's veto by a very significant margin. Those things just don't happen by themselves. It's because of the relationships that you build. So in the next legislature, I look forward to working with my committee again. I look forward to working with Republicans and Democrats to find the best solutions for the people of Maine. Thank you, Andrew. Roger, your thoughts on assessing the functionality of state government and uh, paving the way for uh, the new governor, mm -hmm. and we'll allow an additional uh, 15 seconds to your response to okay. that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I believe state government is functioning. I don't believe it's functioning efficiently. I think there is far too much um, party politics going on, and unfortunately, us, the constituents and taxpayers, are caught in the middle of, of a fight between uh, the different houses uh, in Augusta. Um, I think a new governor coming in, um, hopefully, I believe it's Sean Moody, that will be able to work across the aisles and work with both Republicans and Democrats, uh, such as myself, uh, have many of friends, you know, probably have dealt with over probably 200 plus thousand people um, in the uh, service industry. So uh, compromise is, is one of the things that I don't think um, works very well up at Augusta at the moment. Um, I think that that's something that needs to be worked on and uh, hopefully uh, the new legislature will be able to do that. Thank you. Moving on to a topic of affordable housing, something that many uh, officials in Maine have to grapple with. There is, of course, a notable lack of affordable, ha of affordable housing in our state. So citing specific details, please provide two proposals you have for generating more affordable housing. Roger will lead off with you this time. Um, I'd like to work with local officials to uh, maybe target abandoned buildings to rehab and reissue those. Um, for affordable housing. Uh, I believe the town could always look to see if there are grants available to help with that such thing. I think the second thing and the biggest is probably one of uh, my main points here tonight is taxes, property taxes. Um, you know, landlords set their prices to, to try to uh, cover the levels of their expenses and to get a return on their investment. And unfortunately, the um, those costs get passed on to the tenants. So I think if, if there was a way that we could lower their cost, that that would be another way to uh, reduce the housing um, to benefit Mainers looking for affordable housing. Thank you. Andrew, your response on affordable housing. Affordable housing is uh, a sig very significant issue, particularly in the Portland area and, and in our, our larger cities. Uh, we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can so that uh, that people who aren't able to uh, purchase a home or, or find housing otherwise are able to get into a place. Everyone deserves a roof over their head at night. And so we need to do all we can to make sure that people can afford a place to stay. That all being said, the issue is very complex and it's very intertwined. And so my first, uh, my first proposal would be to figure out why we have a lack of affordable housing. And I think it really depends on the area. The, the reasons might be different in Bangor than they are in Lewiston, than they are in Presque Isle, than they are in Portland. And so we need to figure out why affordable housing is not working in particular locations. Then we can assess what will work and where it will work well. Um, and so it really depends on the particular area of the state. Uh, but I do believe that the issue of, for, of affordable housing is significantly connected uh, to the issue of property taxes. This issue is not going away. It is going to be an issue that this le next legislature needs to address. And we're going to have to continue to, do, to address this issue because property taxes are too high. We, our state uh, has too much of a focus on property taxes. And so we need to take a look at our other taxation system to figure out how we can reduce the burden of property taxes so that more people have more money in their pocket to afford uh, necessary items like housing. 
Thank you. And now, but moving on to kind of an interesting caveat to the discussion about housing and affordable housing, um, some proposals have been thrown out uh, concerning tiny houses, which are defined as 400 square feet or less. Now, most main municipalities are not friendly to this option because they don't actually meet normal uh, building and construction codes. In fact, the bill was proposed um, an act to adopt tiny house standards in the main uniform building and energy code, but the bill did not pass. Now, what are your thoughts on, on this particular option? Um, is it something that you would support? Is it a good option? Um, yes or no, and why? Andrew, we'll start with you. Well, I, I've watched the Tiny Houses show <laughs> on HGTV, and um, I know that tiny houses are not for me, but I say if folks want to live in a tiny house, then more power to them. So, uh, you know, I, who am I to say where and how people are, are to live? In terms of the safety and construction codes, though, how do you... In terms of safety yeah. and construction codes, I, uh, they have to conform to, to uh, the proper safety and construction codes. Uh, whether it com when it comes to life safety, uh, that is of the utmost importance. And so we can't be having homes that are prone to burning down or prone to collapsing, for instance. Um, we have to ensure that they're, they're safe to reside in. Thank you. And Roger, your thoughts on tiny houses as a possible housing solution in the state of Maine? Yes. Yeah. Um, I feel that probably should be left to the local elected officials as well as town's code enforcement to uh, set those standards more so than at the legislature. Um, I am not familiar with the construction of tiny houses. I don't know a whole lot about them. It's, uh, I agree with Andrew, it's not something I think that I could live in, uh, especially with our two dogs. Um, the, so I would, uh, I guess the only question I would want to make sure is that there was a uh, sustainable and affordable way to heat and cool them during uh, Maine's winters and summers. Okay, thank you. And we move now, of course, to the perpetual elephant in the room, the subject of taxes, which we've discussed at some level earlier in this evening. But, you know, of course, everyone wants to know and always wants to know if they're elected officials, what are you going to do to address the high rate of taxation and what is your philosophy concerning the rate of taxation here in the state of Maine? Roger, we'll start with you. I believe in the state of Maine that we, um, we have a spending issue more so than a taxation issue. I believe there's uh, enough revenue in the state for what we do, actually um, an overabundance of it. Um, I would think that uh, Maine taxpayers could use that money a lot better than it's sitting in a general fund somewhere in Augusta or it's money that they haven't figured out a way to spend yet, which is actually a good thing. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we don't, uh, you know, adversely tax those uh, with a higher income as a method of expanding government, because I believe that drives people away and it doesn't attract new families to the state of Maine. I have a buddy in college who thought he was going to retire to Maine until he had heard we are the third highest tax state in the country. And he lives in Connecticut. And so if that tells you anything about what's going on, he doesn't want to come to Maine because of taxes. So I think it's definitely something we need to, uh, to address and, and let Mainers keep more of their money. Thank you. And Andrew, your thoughts on how to address the rate of taxation here in Maine? The issue of taxes is very complicated. We don't have one tax in Maine. We have property tax, we have income tax, we have sales tax, we have the fuel tax. All of these different taxes fund different services uh, and programs around the state. So it really depends on, on what tax we're talking about. In terms of a philosophy about taxation, uh, I, I don't support uh, lowering taxes on high income earners. I do support uh, lowering taxes on low and middle income earners. Uh, because I believe that low and middle, middle income uh, people, working families, uh, deserve a break. Uh, and so, so that's, that's my philosophy about taxation. But, but when it comes to policy making up in Augusta, we have worked over the last three budget cycles to try and reduce the burden on low and middle income people when it comes to income taxes, when it comes to property taxes. We've increased the property tax fairness credit so that people can get $500 or $1,000 back every year from their property taxes. Those type of things make a difference uh, in people's lives. When people are making decisions about uh, what they're going to have for dinner or whether or not they can get their month's worth of medicine, uh, those types of uh, credits and reimbursements make a big difference. 
So we still have a lot of work to do uh, in Maine with respect to taxes. I'm only one of 186 people in the legislature, and so this isn't a dictatorship. I don't get to make the rules. I have to work with my colleagues in the legislature to come up with good proposals. But one of the things that I would like to see uh, from a high-level standpoint is, is significant tax reform in Maine. I think we need to overhaul our tax system, take a whole new look at our income tax and our property tax system. As I mentioned before, we have too much of a focus on property taxes. It's putting too much of a strain on local cities and towns. There has to be a better way forward for our state. When we're able to do comprehensive tax reform, we're able to incentivize businesses, we're able to incentivize small families, um, excuse me, uh, 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 young families to come into our state and move here. So there are lots of ways that we can incentivize growth, incentivize families to come to Maine through our tax system, but it's going to take a concerted bipartisan effort to do that. Thank you. And a, a final subject to touch on, um, and again, Roger, we can allot you an extra 15 seconds to compensate for a longer response from Andrew on the previous question. Um, on the subject of citizen initiatives, do you believe that there should be stricter requirements for future citizen initiatives being brought forward, such as perhaps requiring more signatures or other methods as you might view them? Uh, a one-minute response on this, uh, with the exception of Roger, who, if you take a little extra time, will sure. allow that. Uh, but we'll actually start uh, this round with Andrew. Great. The citizens' initiative process was put in place about 100 years ago, and it was a system that was designed for average citizens to put something on the ballot when they felt like the legislature wasn't doing what a majority of voters thought they should be doing. We're in that time again. There are uh, a majority of Mainers who think that the legislature should be doing things that the legislature is simply not doing, and the legislature has did not pass legislation to increase the minimum wage. It did not pass uh, ranked choice voting. It did not pass a number of other measures that have passed when, uh, when people voted for them. And so this is a reflection of the level of dysfunction that sometimes exists in Augusta. And so I'm not going to advocate for taking away the opportunity for people to put uh, measures on the ballot. What I am in favor of is making sure that the system is working efficiently, uh, but I am not in favor of making sure uh, of, of taking away the opportunity uh, for citizens to put something on the ballot. Thank you, and Roger, your thoughts on citizen initiatives. Thank you. I, I don't think we necessarily need more signatures. I believe uh, there should be equal amount of signatures, though, from both the first and second congressional uh, districts to ensure equal representation across the state. Um, I would disagree maybe that this is the most effective way to address an issue. Um, I think working with elected officials, uh, participating in the legislative process uh, by providing testimony at public hearings, um, or even if it's in writing or calling uh, your representatives, if, if they're not able to get um, the, will of the, the work of the will of the people done, then you can vote them out. That's, that's how um, it works. If, if they're not doing what they should be doing up in Augusta, then, then we have the power to um, vote them out. Um, if we continue uh, with the legislative uh, through initiatives, then it should also be required that regional public hand, uh, hearings um, and mandatory, uh, that public hearings are mandatory uh, before any question uh, appears on the ballot. Thank you. And on a related note, uh, if you don't feel that citizen initiatives are the most effective way for regular citizens to directly address an issue uh, related to governance, uh, what would you offer as an alternative? Uh, Roger, we'll start with you. Um, I think maybe I intertwined the answer to that question okay, yeah. in my last yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> you can feel free to reiterate your thoughts. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I, I just think uh, working with the, our elected officials uh, to, to, to pass legislation um, is the most effective way. Thank you. Andrew, your thoughts on a potential alternative to citizen initiatives if, in fact, one is necessary? Sure. I don't think that we need another alternative. I think the citizens initiative process works fairly well at the moment. Ultimately, the, the best way to, to change our laws in our state is to work with the legislature to do that. That is the most preferable route uh, that people can take. I have sat through hundreds of hearings, and I can tell you that it is 
it is a very um, uplifting process uh, when people come and present their ideas to the committee and we're able to ask questions. That's when the best work is done in Augusta, when it's done with citizen input, when it's done with Republicans and Democrats and independents all together, putting our best ideas forward. And so the best way is through the legislative process up at the State House. But if that's not getting done, people have the absolute right to take it to the ballot, and I support that effort. Thank you. We are approaching, in fact, the close of our, sh of our event this evening. Um, so now would be the, the time to make your final comments or your closing comments. Uh, Andrew, we'll start with you. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for having us. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to share my views on some of these issues, and I appreciate everyone tuning in. As I mentioned, I've had the immense privilege and honor to serve three terms in the Maine House of Representatives, representing part of Gorham and part of Scarborough. It's one of the most humbling tasks and endeavors that I have ever undertaken. And during my time, I've knocked on thousands of doors and had thousands of conversations about your hopes and your dreams and your frustrations. And I've taken all of them to heart and taken them with me to Augusta. While we haven't agreed on everything, I've always taken uh, everything to heart, both the compliments and the criticisms, uh, in an effort to understand the issues better and to better serve our community. I've worked hard every day because I believe that this job is one of the most critical and fundamental jobs that we do, ensuring that we have good laws uh, and, and good policies in our state. I've worked across the aisle with Republicans and Democrats to ensure that the work that we do doesn't get tangled up in politics, but instead is focused on what is right for our communities. During my time, we have worked to reduce property taxes, expand health care to people. We have increased education funding. And as chair of the Transportation Committee, I've worked with a bipartisan group of legislators to try and reform the way that we fund our transportation system in our state. And one of the things I'm most proud of is the work that we have done around the Gorm Connector and trying to get the Gorm Connector built for our community. We have a lot of work ahead of us in the next two years and indeed in the next decade or two, uh, laying out a blueprint for our future, uh, looking to see what uh, our kids uh, are going to live, uh, a state, or the state that our kids are going to live in. On Tuesday, November 6th, I ask for, for your vote for two more years in the state legislature. I hope to earn your vote. I hope I have earned your vote uh, over the last six years, and I hope to earn it once again uh, to continue this very important work in Augusta. Thank you very much. And thank you. And Roger, your closing comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for everyone for tuning in today, those who are here. Um, I think the way I would uh, put this forward is I am looking to make life better for Mainers through reduced taxes, health care, fighting the opioid addiction, um, and, and making sure that those in Augusta remember who they work for. They work for us. And unfortunately, I feel, uh, especially this last session, that maybe that got lost, that a lot of things were uh, partisan. Um, as we see, the legislature did not get out of uh, session as they were supposed to in April. Um, that went on through September, costing taxpayers uh, a lot of money. Um, regardless of whether you're a uh, Republican, a Democrat, or an independent, um, if one thing I would leave you with tonight is just get out and vote. Um, arguing on Facebook, arguing with friends, arguing with family, um, that's not going to solve any of the problems that we have here uh, in the state of Maine. Um, things have become way too personal. Um, I have a friend of mine on Facebook uh, in Scarborough who's in my district. He uh, posted who he was voting for for governor as well as for um, senator in his district. And uh, neither of those uh, voted well for him voting for me. Uh, but I told him, I said, hey, don't forget about District 27. Don't forget about the House. Even if you're not voting for me, make sure you get out and vote. I hope you do vote for me. Um, but you know what? At the end of the day, I'm not going to hold it against them. We'll still go out and have a beer. We'll be friends. And if there was anything I was going to hold against them, is his him being a Yankees fan. Uh, with that, we're going to get done in time. Go Sox. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, we'd like to thank the candidates again for their participation uh, this evening, and we certainly encourage all voters to pursue more information about our candidates by contacting them individually or working through other sources. Now, if you're not able to vote on Election Day, you can call or visit the clerk's office to get an absentee ballot until Thursday, November 1st, and the clerk's office will be open until 7 o'clock on that evening. Early voting can be also be completed at the Municipal Center from October 29th to, uh, through November 1st. And in Maine, you may also register to vote on Election Day at your polling location. Information will follow on voting locations, town business hours, <coughs> and where you can get more information. On behalf of everyone at Gorham Government Education Television, again, I'm Beth Jones Sanborn, reminding you to please get out and vote on November 6th. Thank you, everyone, and good night.